Hi, I'm William, and today I'm going to be talking about quantum pseudorandomness and classical complexity. So uh, to explain a little bit about what this talk is about, so I'm mostly going to be talking about something called pseudorandom quantum states, which I will sometimes abbreviate as PRSs. And intuitively, you can think of pseudorandom states as being computational approximations to the Haar measure, so to random uh, unit vectors, random quantum states. And if I had to summarize in one sentence what this talk is about, I would say, uh, I guess the goal is to try to better understand uh, where do PRSs fit in the complexity theoretic landscape? And this is sort of a deliberately vague question. Um, we'll sort of see that uh, as we think about this question a little bit more, it sort of uh, even <laughs> raises even more questions than it answers perhaps. And even by the end of this talk, you maybe see that um, we sort of understand less about PRSs than we would really like to. But hopefully I'll be able to at least um, give a little flavor for what this is about. And um, I'll also, as I said, I'll uh, give you a slightly more precise definition of what pseudorandom states are and um, explain why you should care about them. Uh, and indeed, so the first thing I'll actually talk about before I dive into any of the technical details is just uh, why are PRSs interesting? And there's a few um, applications that were discovered recently. So the first is maybe the most obvious. So pseudorandom states are sort of a cryptographic pseudorandom primitive and hence they can be used for cryptography. For instance, we know they can be used for quantum money schemes, but there's probably other examples that are yet to be discovered. Uh, another potential application is in physical simulation or physical computation. Maybe you're taking some average where you need uh, generic looking quantum states. You're taking an average over the harm measure and they're uh, producing harm random states or even information theoretic approximations to harm random states can be very, very expensive. And so pseudorandom states can in some cases be, uh, potentially be cheaper when people are doing computations on an actual quantum device. Uh, and finally, there's what I think is maybe the most exciting and compelling application, which is uh, a recent connection that was established by Boland, Pfefferman, and Vazirani between uh, any possible resolution to a couple of questions in black hole physics and pseudorandom states. So, so pseudorandom states are actually playing a key role in these physics questions uh, involving ADS-CFT in particular. So between all of these, I think no matter which way you look at it, uh, PRSs are a good thing to try to understand. And that's, that's sort of what this talk is hopefully gonna be about. So uh, I guess I'm now ready to just give you the, the definition of pseudorandom states. And these were introduced by Ji, Liu, and Song in 2018. And we say that a set of states is pseudorandom, so it's keyed by some n-bit string, let's say. And there's two requirements. One is that we can efficiently generate these states, meaning that there's some polynomial time quantum algorithm where if I give you k, this key, then you can produce copies of uh, phi sub k, this uh, one of the states in this ensemble. And the second requirement is this uh, computational indistinguishability requirement, which says that for any uh, polynomial time quantum adversary and for any polynomial number of copies t, uh, this adversary cannot if it, uh, distinguish uh, copies of a hard random state from copies of a pseudo random state. So the advantage it gets in distinguishing these two things is negligible. Um, one thing that might jump out at you is that this looks a lot like the definition of a pseudo random generator. And in some sense, this sort of is just a quantum analog of uh, pseudorandom generator. So, so just as a, a pseudorandom generator is like a computational approxima approximation of the uniform distribution, so uh, pseudorandom states are computational approximations of the Haar measure. Uh, I would say the key difference is this one con condition here where we allow the adversary to have multiple copies of the state. Uh, and this, I, I guess the justification for this is the no cloning principle where um, you know, an, an adversary can potentially do much more with many copies of the state than with just one copy of the state. We want the adversary to, to have to distinguish multiple copies. Um, maybe another thing I should briefly mention, um, it's important to emphasize that these are different from T designs. If you've never heard of T designs, then don't worry. But if you have, uh, the key difference between this and T designs is that in T designs, well, there's two differences. One is that uh, in T designs, you fix T in advance, whereas here T can be any polynomial in N. Uh, and the second is that here, this is fundamentally a cryptographic notion, and hence we're only considering computationally bounded adversaries. 
By contrast, team designs usually uh, they're defined such that they have to work for any adversary or essentially just any possible quantum measurement you can perform. So this is the definition. And uh, so, okay, so what do we what do we know about pseudorandom states? Well, um, turns out one of the only things we know about pseudorandom states is how to construct them. And in the same paper where pseudorandom states were first defined, uh, it was shown that uh, if quantum secure one-way functions exist, then uh, secure pseudorandom states also exist. Uh, and I'd say for, for most people, this is pretty compelling evidence. You know, one-way functions, we usually think of them as sort of a, a mini crypt primitive. You know, these are, are less strong of an assumption compared to the things we need for like public key cryptography. Um, but I think one thing that hasn't been explored as much is actually looking in the other direction, which is um, assuming the suit of random states exist, what else can we say must be true? Can we get um, other cryptographic primitives? Are there other complexity theoretic implications of pseudorandom states that we should be aware of? Uh, in fact, this was even based as an open problem in this original paper. Uh, one of the questions they asked was basically, is there a converse to this theorem? So do pseudorandom states imply one-way functions? Um, what I'm gonna try to show you is that actually, in some sense, there's even more basic questions that we don't know about uh, pseudorandom states. And there's some kind of bizarre subtleties that happen here. And I'm going to show you this by, by just giving you an example of something where uh, we sort of know that pseudorandom states imply some problem is hard, but at the same time, we really don't. So, so what do I mean by this? Well, I'm going to show you uh, a, I guess, a QMA protocol to break pseudorandom states. So QMA, as we know, stands for quantum Merlin Arthur. This is the complexity class of problems that can be verified efficiently by quantum device. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's also described as being like quantum analog of NP. So um, here, Arthur is this you know, computationally bounded verifier and Merlin is this all powerful wizard, but perhaps untrustworthy who can, who's, you know, trying to convince Arthur. Uh, and Arthur has to, you know, either become convinced or catch Merlin lying basically. And I claim that there's sort of a QMA protocol to break pseudorandom states, and it goes like this. Uh, suppose Arthur has a bunch of copies of some quantum state. Here's what Merlin can do. Merlin can send Arthur a description of some quantum circuit C, and Merlin basically claims that this circuit uh, can be used to produce this state. So what does Arthur do? So Arthur runs the circuit on, say, the all zeros input, and then checks that this produces a copy of psi. And you can do this in you know, many different ways. It suffices to just do this via the swap test, especially since you have multiple copies of psi, you can reduce the, the soundness of this arbitrarily low. And so you can become convinced that psi at least has a short description or that it does not if, if this protocol fails. Um, and so why does this break uh, pseudorandom states? Well, if the state is a, from the pseudorandom ensemble, then we know by way of the efficient generating algorithm, but there's always a short description. By contrast, it's not too hard to show by a counting argument that if psi is a hard random state, then no such um, short description will even approximately produce a state that's close to psi. Hence, in this sense, there's, there's a, a QMA algorithm to break pseudorandom states. And so what does that imply? Well, if nothing else, that, that sort of implies that there's some QMA problem that must be hard in order for pseudorandom states to exist. Except uh, there's one problem with this. And if, if I actually, if I had a live audience, this is where I would like pause the video and or, uh, pause the talk, I guess, and ask, you know, what's, what's wrong with this? But I guess I just have to move on because there's no one here. So uh, it turns out what's kind of wrong with this is that while this is a, a quantum Merlin Arthur protocol, this is not a QMA language, or at least it does not define a QMA language. And the reason is that the input here, the state psi is, is fundamentally a quantum input. It's not an n-bit string, but complexity classes like QMA, BQP, P, NP, these are defined in terms of languages, which are subsets of n-bit strings. So, you know, in some sense, it's not really clear that uh, the ability to break pseudorandom states relates at all to, uh, let's say, QMA or even any other complexity classes. So, uh, and this was actually my original motivation for this work, was I was basically wondering, is this uh, an inherent 
limitation? Is this sort of just a conceptual misunderstanding? Is there maybe a more clever way to make some sort of QMA reduction that does turn it into a language? Uh, this is something I, I wanted to know. And that was, uh, for me, the, the original motivation for this work. Um, and that brings me uh, right into the first result, which basically shows this is actually not just a conceptual issue and that there is something really kind of bizarre going on here. Uh, so in particular, what I show is that there exists a quantum oracle O uh, with the following two properties. One, BQP equals QMA relative to O, and two, pseudo-random pseudo states exist relative to O. Now, uh, this should look very surprising and bizarre. Um, I certainly was surprised when I first uh, <laughs> realized that this was true. And the reason it's so bizarre is that if uh, BQP equals QMA relative to any oracle, then uh, relative to that oracle, like no classical cryptographic primitives exist. Um, One-way functions, public key cryptography, you name it, anything, you know, all of those can generally be broken by NP adversaries. And so, uh, well, if BQP equals QMA, then BQP contains NP and hence all of those can be broken efficiently by quantum algorithms. So somehow this is, uh, I mean, there's you know many ways to look at this, right? But one is one is that this is a black box separation between uh, pseudo random states and essentially uh, all other interesting cryptographic primitives that are purely classical. Um, so, so this, yeah, this is this is rather surprising. Um, and okay, yeah, there's this one caveat: this is a quantum oracle rather than classical oracle, but. Um, so this sort of raises the question is, well, okay, if this, if this is true, then can we place any upper bound of what it takes to break pseudo-random states, right? So this is, this is in some sense saying that even if you could efficiently solve QMA problems, that would not be sufficient to break pseudo-random states, at least in the black box setting. Uh, and that brings us to the second result, which shows that, uh, yes, we can place some upper bound, which is that, um, if BQP equals PP, meaning if we can uh, efficiently solve sharp P complete problems on a quantum device, then pseudo random states do not exist. Uh, and this, I should also mention, this also holds relative to oracles. So, um, so that's that's sort of the best upper bound we know of. So, um, and before I even tell you about like how we prove these, I'm also just going to tell you a little bit about some other applications of these results. Um, the first application is a new impossibility result for something called hyper-efficient shadow tomography. So uh, if you've heard of shadow tomography, then great. So this was introduced in, in a paper by Aronson in 2017. Um, it's a kind of procedure for simultaneously performing a bunch of different observables on some quantum state given a bunch of copies of that state. And uh, Aronson showed that this, uh, this task can be very information theoretically efficient in the sense that it uses few copies of the state. But one of the open questions was sort of, in what cases can this be made computationally and uh, efficient? And Aronson gave some evidence that in general, this can't really be made computationally efficient. What we do in this work is we actually slightly strengthen some of those results. So, so there's a, a more general class of problems for which uh, you probably cannot even expect computationally efficient shadow tomography. Uh, a second result is actually a new result about oracle separation. So if you, if you care about oracles, um, you could define uh, relativized versions of, of quantum complexity classes where you have like a collection of far random oracles. So you choose like one har random oracle for every uh, input length n, or even like two to the n different har random oracles for every input length n. It's like one for every n bit string. Uh, and the, the interesting consequence we show is that um, if uh, BQP, if you can show an oracle separation between Q, PQP and QMA relative to these har random oracles, then in fact BQP is not equal to QMA in the unrelativized world. Or um, viewed another way, you know, the, the contrapositive: if BQP equals QMA, then BQP also equals QMA relative to our har random oracle. Um, this is maybe a little surprising because this is not true. Um, or at least we don't expect something like this to be true for, uh, say, a random classical oracle, right? Indeed, uh, for a random classical oracle, we can show that BQP is not equal to QMA with probability one. Um, and we don't, 
know how to show that implies uh, BGP is not equal to QMA and the unvalid implies QL, of course, that would be a, a huge breakthrough. So um, just another, you know, kind of interesting consequence. And I guess if you haven't seen our random oracles, this, um, yeah, so just that maybe our random oracles can be a little bit uh, different from classical oracles. So um, I think that's everything I wanted to say about the results. So with that, I'm going to start diving a little bit into how we prove some of these. Uh, so starting off with this uh, oracle separation that I mentioned on this previous slide. So how do we prove this? Well, uh, turns out the oracle is actually pretty simple to describe. So it consists of two parts. One part is a, uh, a collection of har random unitaries. So this is kind of the thing I was alluding to on the previous slide. You, you just choose a bunch of different har random unitaries, one for every um, n bit string. And then the second part is you choose any p space complete language. Um, and the claim is that uh, BQP equals QMA relative to this oracle. So why is this true? Well, uh, the proof idea turns out to be that in some sense, um, a QMA algorithm cannot learn any interesting property at all of this um, par random oracle. It might as well just not be there because like any queries it's making, this just turns out to be completely useless. Um, and the reason turns out to be for uh, the extremely strong concentration of measure properties that are exhibited by har random unitary matrices. Um, I will mention that this is not the first work that sort of uses these kinds of properties to get a result like this. So for instance, um, I believe similar tools were used to show that like a hard random state is useless for magic state distillation, for instance. Uh, and this is, you know, conceptually actually pretty similar what's going on here. It's just maybe the first time this is being used in like a complexity theoretic context like this. So in some sense, what this is saying is you can almost just like cross out this hard random oracle and you're just left with this p-space oracle. Uh, and there we know that okay, QMA to the P space equals BQP to the P space equals P space just by standard complexity theoretic reductions. Uh, okay, but there was a second part to this theorem, which is that we also claim pseudo random states exist relative to this oracle. Uh, and this is like even more straightforward. This is basically just the, um, the BBBV theorem uh, applied to a, a quantum oracle. So, um, you know, somehow you can show that basically it's a hard search problem. If you could break these pseudo random states, then you could solve, uh, basically you could beat Grover's algorithm, um, which we know you can't do. Uh, and of course this, this P-space complete language, this doesn't make any difference because this is a query complexity lower bound, right? I can give you arbitrary, the, the whole point of query complexity is I can give you arbitrary computational power, but all that matters at the end of the day is the number of queries you're making to this unitary oracle which we can show has to be exponential if you want to break these pseudo random states. Uh, so that's basically the, the key ideas that go into this first result. For our second result, um, showing that uh, pseudo random states do not exist if BQP can solve sharp p-complete problems, there's sort of two ingredients in this. Uh, the first is something called a, well, what they call the classical shadows protocol due to Huang, Kung, and Preskill uh, just last year. Uh, and the other is uh, Aronson's celebrated theorem involving post selection. So, showing that B, uh, quantum algorithms, so BQP augmented with post selection, turns out to be equal to probabilistic polynomial time. So, what's the idea here? Well, um, it turns out that this classical shadows protocol actually gives you an algorithm that can information theoretically distinguish pseudo random states from har random states. Um, unfortunately, it's still computationally expensive, but it has some interesting properties. Namely, um, the computationally expensive part is sort of purely classical. Um, so what this protocol shows is that there's some measurements you can perform on a quantum state that actually let you essentially information, uh, information theoretically distinguish whether it's pseudo-random or hard-random. And furthermore, those measurements can be done efficiently. Uh, in fact, the measurements, it's literally you're just performing random Clifford measurements. So you just take a bunch of random Clifford measurements and it turns out that is enough to distinguish par random from pseudo random if you can do the right uh, post-processing. Uh, what we show, I guess, in this work is that you can do this post-processing efficiently, at least for this distinguishing task, using some clever tricks involving post-selection. And by this theorem that um, post BQP equals PP, this shows you that if uh, BQP equals PP, 
then pseudo random states do not exist because you can break them. Uh, so that's basically the, the key ideas that went into the second result. And I think with that, I'm just going to conclude with a few of my favorite open problems related to this work. Um, maybe the most obvious question that's left open is whether you can prove the same results relative to classical oracles. So as I mentioned, this result involving pseudo-random states and QMA, this is sort of a, a quantum oracle. Um, and you know, it's just a very natural question whether that can be made a classical oracle. Um, one thing I will comment on this is that this sort of runs into the same limitations that other oracle separations involving quantum oracles seem to run into, where um, it's just not clear how you simulate par randomness with a classical oracle in a way that um, mimics the same properties. And so, uh, so for instance, if you're familiar with the Aaron, uh, Aronson Cooperberg result giving an oracle separation between QMA and QCMA, where they also asked if that can be made classical, uh, it turns out kind of similar problems might arise here. Um, I think a second compelling question is whether we can give other evidence for the existence of pseudorandom states. So we gave some evidence in here that uh, actually pseudorandom states might be a weaker cryptographic primitive than most other things we usually think of as being cryptographic, right? Um, we, we constructed a black box separation between these and not just the existence of say one-way functions, but even between a separation between BQP and QMA. So it'd be interesting to know if uh, we can sort of get by with some weaker complexity theoretic assumptions that imply the existence of pseudorandom states um, in, in a non-trivial sense, of course. Um, finally, I think one thing that would also be interesting to explore is uh, quantum meta complexity or you know, the complexity of complexity. So, so what do I mean by this? Well, say uh, I give you a bunch of copies of some quantum state, and then I ask you, uh, what is the size of the smallest quantum circuit that approximately produces that state? Um, this is sort of a, a meta complexity problem because now I'm asking you, okay, what is, how hard is this problem basically? Um, and recently there've been a, a bunch of breakthroughs in complexity theory, learning theory, and cryptography that have used um, kind of a meta complexity lens. And I would be really interested to know um, whether any of those techniques can be ported to these kinds of problems. Um, but these kinds of problems are sort of inherently related to breaking pseudorandomness because, you know, pseudorandom states are inherently states of low complexity that somehow look like states of high complexity. So, um, maybe some of these tools could help us better understand um, what kinds of things. Yeah, so, so maybe this would help us better understand what other evidence we can get for the existence of pseudorandom states. Um, and with that, this basically concludes the talk. Um, if you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to email me, or otherwise, uh, I will see you at the live session where I will also be happy to answer questions. So thank you.